as we as we move along this wheel of the heroine's journey, um, and we understand what identifying the monster is, and we understand how the monster tests us long before the monster is even aware of us, and the allies and adversaries that we bring to bear on our journey, and the descent into peril, which is a peril we create in order to further refine the mission. Um, there is a moment <clears throat> where we realize, the founder realizes, they have actually overcome they are in the process of overcoming mm. the ordeal. And that implies triumph, which is not what overcoming is. And you, you ended our last conversation by saying, I had a sense of overcoming the ordeal simultaneous with excruciating pain. Mm. That's not triumph. But it is a powerful state of beingness that we're talking about when the founder realizes that what they've, the perils they've endured, they have overcome. Can you talk to us about that part of the founder's journey when all those adversaries and perils and all the things come to bear and you realize on some level you cannot be annihilated and that your story will survive? What is that moment, and how do we know it, and what does it feel like? <clears throat> I just, well, I think it starts with, I don't know if it starts, but it did for me. Recognizing that the thing you built has so much momentum, it can kill you. Like, you're so... You've built something that has so much momentum that the world has decided you're not this person to take it forward. Is actually a, a sort of moment of pride. It's like, well, you know. The only thing that could take me out was the thing I built. That thing must be pretty powerful. So where does the monster fit in this moment? that you've created something strong enough to be perpetually pitted against the monster? I think um, another way of looking at it is you've got an organization that's sick of you but will take the monster on knowing full worth what the monster is. So you've set the course for the ship. Which is something to be pretty proud of. Yeah. You know. Not only are they want, still going to take the monster on, they don't believe they need your help. You can take that as a real, oh, woe is me moment. Or you could be like, I built something. I changed the course of that whole thing. And it doesn't need my touch or action. For it to re-engage, you know, that same monster. It's not my monster. Yeah. So in that moment, <clears throat> when the mission is reaffirmed, and the men, the people, are protected, whether that protection, however that protection happens, because mm. sometimes it's painful, like you had to let people go, but you helped them find work and you, you protected them. What does the founder do with myself when they've been, they've been escorted out? And what happens when they want to pretend that they didn't escort you out because they need counsel and advice? You're a founder whisperer. Everybody knows you're a wise character. What happens when they circle around for the advice? Or what happens to the self in overcoming your deal? Isn't the last casualty you? Yeah, I, I think um, 
you're just back to being unemployable. So you better figure that out. So is the end of this journey when it comes to the peril part of it? It ends with a whimper or a pop instead of a bang? When you're not dead, no one's trying to blow you up anymore. You have more time to think. You have more tools that you've built. You've got more skills. You have a estimation of worth. You have an objective one. So, you know, you're just unemployable again. Except we know that the last pieces of this journey yeah. are returning to community and bringing back the lessons you have learned. Yeah. And, and holding the stance of the elder who listens and asks questions. So knowing that we're not over, we're not into that territory yet. We're really in this moment of o overcoming the ordeal. Can we go back earlier to the elation or the, where is the moment where one sees, forget the aftermath now, let's go back even further. When do you know you've overcome? When do you know that you're no longer surrounded? When do you know? When the commander turns his back on you and walks away without saying anything, presumably you know something, but you don't know. You could find out later that day that you're being shipped home. How do you know you've overcome the ordeal? My first response is I don't know if I've overcome the ordeal. And I don't think, and I'm not sure if you can. But my survival response is well, you know, I have to, it's like I have bills to pay. I have no time to think about this. It's fine. And I know I'm not employable. So, is so I the... better start making some form of manoeuvre to pay these bills after putting all of my money back into it. So, right. so is this the new peril? Is this the new surrounded? For a <clears> moment... <throat> But it's a hallucination. It's not real. So you, you can say, oh, I don't, you know, I'm unemployable, but I've just been given the best MBA in the world. Yeah. And you're and being a called to work. substantial network of people that aren't in that organization. And you're being called to work on behalf of a lot of people. Yeah. You know, those people didn't always appear straight away, but. You know, it was like, I can get a job, I can do this, you know. This organization wanted me to be the chief revenue officer, and I, da, 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 da. And I was like, I don't fucking work for anyone. And I need to remember that. I don't do my best work working for someone. So, you know, it's a hallucination. You're not in peril. It's almost like freedom. It's like a... It's a freedom from the current version of the monster that I'm currently engaging. Right. So it's tired anyway. Yeah. So that, what, as I listen to you, I think about, we tend to look at overcoming the ideal, the ordeal as a, a moment of triumph over the content. But what you're saying is overcoming the ordeal is actually the, alchemization of the ordeal into something else yeah i would it's say it's no longer the annihilating event it's the passageway through which the next phase takes place yeah so like i, I spat out of it going you know what went wrong <clears throat> why do i deserve this why has this moment of failure happened again 
Why do I have nothing of value? Even though I did all the work. Knowing that heaps of people have a lot of value. Why isn't anyone asking me how I am? After all the times I spent helping people overcome the impossible in themselves. Why isn't anyone reaching out to me to ask what I'm up to? Why am I not getting any kudos for keeping it alive? Why is everyone angry with me when they talk to me about it? So why? Why, why, why do I think that I'm not, why do I think I'm worthless? And you know, It was, it, was a, it was a cycle of that for quite a while, you know, a few weeks. And then you, you start to realize that actually in the last few years, no one's given you a compliment, ever. So maybe you just had the wrong people around you. People would always tell you what not to do, but it would never come from your customers. You know, a lot of... St- people had gone on and created other things after working for us that are doing valuable things, you know. And then you get these messages all the time of, you know, when you came and saw me after you, we did your training, you got us that job, that job changed my life. You're getting these messages every now and then. It's like, well, you know, there's the reality and there's the reality. I haven't been in the reality in a long time. So I'd forgotten who I was. So the ultimate overcoming... So the triumph was remembering that I was valuable and that I can do things that a lot of people can't do. And then I've gone and done it. So is it fair to say that the real overcoming of the real ordeal is the remembering of who you are and what your worth is? Mm. Yeah, I would say it's finally identifying as the as the entrepreneur. There's no other person that I can be, so why keep fighting it? I spent so much time fighting it. I don't want to be the CEO. I don't want to be the chairman. I don't want to be the face of this anymore. I don't... They're all things that I did completely wrong. A lot of things would have been differently if I just embraced who I was. I want to be the warrior. I want to go back and do that. You, I know you've read a lot about entrepreneurs, and you know I, I'm just curious. I don't remember what was Steve Jobs' frame of mind after he left Apple the first time. Did he, did he was turfed out? Yeah. Um, did he know? Was there was there any self attack in that moment for him? Did he sort of have any doubts, or did he just think, no, they, these fucking guys will be coming back. They'll be climbing back. No, I, I think. Um... He'd always been the non-engineer in a room of engineers, but un- understood engineering. So I feel like he was always the old one out. So, um, so he's used to it. Yeah, I think so. I, I think deep down, though, he knew that. You know, there's a lot. If you watch the management videos at the same time you watch his interviews about the company, that they're very different. You know, he spent a lot of time building the managers of that organization. Whether anyone wants to say it or not, you you see the videos about how he picked engineers over professional managers and how he'd run these retreats and take them through importance and all of these things. And then he just keeps doing it, you know. He doesn't, he just brings it back, but he markets it a different way. Um, He doesn't really change who he is. So I would say that I think it really, really hurt him. Uh when they spat him out. I don't know if he'd admit it, but I think it really did. I think that's why he was there so long. I think that's why he was the CEO for so long. Again. That wasn't a, I need to be the CEO to make this work. Is it, you know, I got exiled as the king and now you're all under, you know, my realm. Right. And I've, I've given up everything to get the realm back. So, But there's no condition, for example, under which you would return to your realm. You seem, your eyes seem set on a further horizon than the realm 
I mean, in some sense, the work you're doing is greater than the platform you built. You've built, I note that you've built what the realm you built, you've woven into the realm you're building now. It's a piece of it, but the realm seems a lot bigger. I think, um, yeah, I don't see, I don't see the need. Right. You know. It, I think it's all, it's one part of a problem, and um, but it's not everything in that problem. So, if overcoming the ordeal is the remembering of who you are, yeah, what did you remember? Uh, no one's coming. that my mission comes before my men and my men come before myself and I better find a new mission very quickly and, and then I found some men to work with on it uh, and then I can work on myself after I do those two things and I invested heavily in that. It's a very surreal moment to get on calls where people would compliment and understand your work. It's very different that when a compliment comes from understanding, you know, a respectful compliment is a is a fascinating gift. Unspecified praise is a very dangerous thing mm. because when we are praised. For that specific thing, we already know that we've done it. Yeah. And the praise is simply confirmation. Yeah. Mm. So then, <clears throat> if we think back on your journey, because the last two sessions are really no longer about you, they're about the next phase of the mission. The, 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 the overcoming of the ordeal is the last piece of the Tom Moore story. Mm. The, the last two sessions, you belong first to a community that you have to find and as an elder you have to be. So in this overcoming, I just want to stay here for a moment because it's a very, it's a very painful place, but it's a awake place. Mm. You remember who you are, no one's coming, mission before men before self, finding a new mission. All the tools you've built all the tests you've passed, all the allies you have found and lost, all the adversaries who have sharpened you and disappeared. Is it worth it? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I wouldn't have met my wife. So, if I hadn't done it, I wouldn't have met her. I don't think. And that was probably the best gift to come of it. She was the first person that told me, saw the value in me. It's very interesting. The real value. Not the... Yeah, not what you can do for me, but the real value. No, it's like, what are you really... What is the? What, what is your founder gift? Yeah. So, you know, I, you could argue that you would have met, maybe, maybe not. But I would say that outside of that, it probably it wasn't worth it. But I have no other choice. So there's no point talking about it. Like, dude, I'm unemployable. Because I, I can't do anything else. The, the, the less you fight it, the easier it becomes. Are all founders unemployable? Real ones. Yeah. I don't think they're employable. Because they see how to enhance something. Or create something. And most, most people don't. 
Why do so many founders perish? And they just forget who they are. You're the only one that can remove your willpower. No one else can. They just forget who they are. So you led a session in New York that I attended, mm. which was called, you know, why are founders imperiled? Mm. Why are they imperiled? Because and the implication is they, they're, they may not survive. They may not overcome the ordeal. They may not. Yeah, it's a, it's a pioneering endeavor. So. so why are they? It's directly related to death. You, you, a high chance you'll die. So why, why are they imperiled? Why isn't the world banging at the drum for this creativity and these new ways of thinking and what's not to like about a founder's idea that's worked and yet they're so solitary and beleaguered and imperiled. In that session that you led, mm -hmm. there were three founders who acknowledged themselves as founders and none of them had begun. Mm -hmm. They wanted to begin, but they were frightened, rightly so. And you did not encourage them. Mm -hmm. You said, you haven't begun, think carefully because it ends often in sorrow. So what's the problem? I think it's a trust problem. <clears throat> they don't know who to trust. Well, it starts with, I don't know what if I'm doing actually creates value. Right? You get then I, I don't know who I need to partner with and I'm not sure if they're the right partnership. Then I'm not sure who I should share my idea with because I think people would steal it. Then, you know, then I'm not sure who I should, you know, all of these things keep occurring. And, you know, they develop this huge, huge <clears throat> mistrust. It's like you're driving at night, you don't have a map. You think you're going the right way. It's like, fuck, are we actually going the right way? It's like leading men in the jungle. It's like, are we actually going the right way? We don't know until we're there, if we got there. No features. Everyone's relying. Everyone's watching you pull your map out for the eighth time. You can't see the fucking map anyway. Why are you pulling it out? You know? And you see the sweat just drip down these commanders' faces. They get lost them. They get lost because they start to doubt. They start to trust their own instincts. So I, you know, so I think it's, they get so beleaguered because they get surrounded by so much opportunity for mistrust based off critique that they never ever gain from criticism that leads to encouragement and if no one's done it before then of course everything is new and unusual and there'll be bumps in the road you know i remember you know uh, it was like maybe year four of the company and i come across Elliot jocks and i was just trying to figure out why can't these people see potential in others? And I, and I worked out how to match the team, structure the team by temperament, aptitude, skills, how to build a best team. And I couldn't get the best unit or the best division. And then I worked out the cognitive aptitude doesn't affect time span. Certain components of cognitive aptitude does. Abstraction does. Comprehension and abstraction, the way that thoughts are brought together. And there's these layers and layers and layers. And this time span thinker's name is? Elliot Jux. He's a... Is How do you spell his last name? Uh, like the French. You know, Jacques. Yeah, Elliot Jacques. Yeah. yeah, okay. And, um, you know, I, the point is it's not about Elliot Jacques, but what, Elliot, what did I stub at Elliot Jacques? I realized two things. Someone had already done a lot of the things that I had done. Thinking, I was thinking they were creative. They were not creative. I just found Elliot Jacques at age 66. So let me ask you a question. And then I realized what he didn't have, which was a computer. So then I could access and get more test results than he could ever could to enhance it. But the reason why it was really important for me as a founder is that I knew I was right. So I stopped not trusting myself then. And that's when the trajectory of the company changed.
Because up until that point, I didn't know what I was doing with the hiring and recruiting system was the right way to go. I believed it was the right way to go, but I didn't know. And stumbling upon Elliot Jacques, who had already solved so much of the other side of the problem, his whole life, um, I knew that it, w- it was what was missing. So then it stopped becoming about what the solution was and how can you get people to use it. That's when our business changed. So let me ask you. But that was a relief moment. Like I could die after that and I'd be, yeah. I'd be happy. So let me ask you a question. At a certain point in your work, uh, I know from your dis- discussions with you, at a certain point in your work, you came across a thinker named Elliot Jacques who thought about time spans. Mm. He identified thinkers who think in terms of day long, week long, month long, five to 10 year long, mm. 20 to 50, 50 beyond. And somehow for you, that was an unlocking observation. The idea of time spans in the cognitive execution of people. Why was that such a big deal? Why time spans? What does time span have to do with this founder story? Right. I don't think it hasn't hasn't got much to do with many other people's founders journey, but it's got to do with my own. So I'd obsessed about showing someone what skills they could learn. In a specialized economy, the your attitude that there's a link to that skill, that's what you should focus all your time on. So help people get great at one thing. Then the conversation came about helping people join the right team. So we did a whole bunch of team matching and personality based off temperament, you know, pairing creative people with non-creative people for a turnaround problem. So we need to be turnaround. You need to bring creatives in. You need the chaos. Why add more chaos when you're in chaos? Because they're the ones that know how to harness chaos. We did all that. And it worked some of the time. So we're still missing something. Then we worked out, we're not just adding people to teams and to new jobs. We're adding them to new bureaucracies. So how do we work out if the bureaucracy is failing or is functional? And where should people sit in the bureaucracy? So what department should people join? After job, team, department. Elliot Jacques showed us, based off his time span model, that someone will report to someone with the next level of time span. So then you know what department to put them in and what their boss and who their boss should be. And then the loops closed. The eureka moment for me from Elliot Jocks was that he'd gone top down but was saying the same foundational computational model that I was. And I don't have any background in psychoanalytica. So So translate that into a very simple language. What do you mean? He An expert that was an outlier in his field was saying that my approach was correct. And your approach was? That, like the whole thing, like it's not a simple answer. It is that you get someone in the right job based off aptitude, they join the right team, and then their time span level functions to create a functional bureaucracy. Right. No pile of games, no bullshit terms. If you want a functional bureaucracy where people are productive, you need people working for the right time span, people in the right team, people doing the right skill. And a good example of the wrong time span is someone who has a 25 year time span working for someone who has a year long time span. And it's, yes, but it's not that simple because they won't work for them. <clears throat> They'll just report to them. Right. And that's why organizations are dysfunctional and that's why they form committees. Right. And that's why they don't work when, when they should work. But it's a very complicated topic. The point I'm trying to make is that an outlier in his field 60 years before was using the other half of the model that we'd built. And he validated our side and we validated his. Very interesting. Yeah. So let me ask you, since we're still, these are out of the ordeal. These are the tools that you are bringing back from the ordeal. This is why you have overcome the ordeal, because you're bringing these tools out. Let's just talk about capital. 
and extractors mm. um, in the ordeal that founders face you faced it often founders face it is the extractors are not unlike the characters that you described in Afghanistan who wear the uniform but actually are informants mm. they're not visible at first extractors understand the language of vision of strategy of collaboration of collegiality but they're extractors one of the greatest ordeals that faces a founder is when they realize that the extractors have become more powerful powerful and more ever present inside their ecosystem than they realized you live that in the war where you're suddenly having to look after people inside a system where you can't tell who's who. What does the founder, first of all, are the extractors playing this game because they need to deceive the founder in order to realize the value, in order to them maximize it? Can you talk about the extractor mindset and what you've learned about it as a founder? Do they wake up in the morning, you know, twizzling their mustache and saying, today I'm going to extract value out of this company? I don't think so. Right. So what's going on? Who I are they? I don't know. They're the opposite of who I am, so I don't know. You've had a lot of experience with them. Who do you think they are? I think they're gatekeepers. So I think they are. Talk about that. What does gatekeeper mean to you? It's like that. At the same time that Colonel threatened me, he offered, didn't he? That's why he thought he'd do it publicly. He offered. It wasn't just a threat. It was an offer. And the extractor's offer is deadly, isn't it? They offer. They don't wait for you to answer either. So I know founders that have been controlled and done what it needed to do. Or they did what was said. Are they happy? I don't know. It's asking. But I do know that generally the second company of a founder is much more successful than the first. And it's after they've got their own capital behind them to do it. Right. Um, so I think it's an. I think they're a gatekeeper to a class. That's what I think they are, at a fundamental level. And it's a class of extractors. Yeah, it's probably more a tax. Pay your tax. Uh, we'll control. You know, you'll pay tribute. You'll exit the way we need you to exit, because that's when we make our money. But you know, you'll make yours. You'll make some, maybe. And if you're easy to deal with. We might make it a little bit more easy for you, but we probably won't. And then let's see where you land afterwards. You know? Let's see if you go on another raid or a quest, if you're not too beaten. I think that's how they think. You know? We'll let you go on another quest. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's how they think. I think they're gatekeepers and they know it. And they, they try to hide things that are mysterious, like financial models. It's like, it's not that hard. You know, and they hide behind analysts that tell you. The analyst doesn't know your business, they speak to a customer. So how would they really understand it? And they hide behind regulation and they hide behind, but they outsource it all. So, you know, it's not, they don't really, really what they are at the end of the day is access to the people that they get the money from. But they would say to you, without me, you're nothing. You can't build this without my capital, and I'm giving it to you. I don't even think they say it. I think they know. And the real founders know too. Can the founder avoid extractors? If they get their market timing right, and the, the product is 100 times better than what's on offer, yes. And that does happen. It really does. And some of it's luck, some of it isn't, but, you know. But it's the exception, not the rule. I think so. I don't know enough about it. I don't. I haven't spent a lot of time tracking the the successful entrepreneurs. I've spent more time talking to ones that are stuck. 
And when you think about, as we still... Because the successful ones don't really want to meet you because they don't really trust anyone. Right. Which is interesting. But the stuck ones have no choice but to trust you because they're stuck. Yeah. In the rare disease world, the healthy don't want to share their data. But the sick will make their data completely available. Or they don't want to share that they're actually sick. Right. So let me ask you then, if we stay inside this, we're still inside the frame of the ordeal, and you're changing the shape of ordeal now to mm. these succession of ordeals, that it's not like some dragon that's slain or some monster that's slain. The monster is multi-headed. And so each of these ordeals is its own monster head. What is the founder's best strategy to think about managing the necessary extractors, assuming they're not the one-off that can hit the market at the right time with the right product, assuming that they know they need capital. What's the counsel that you have for them to, to start a quest with people who are not interested? They're interested in leveraging the quest, but not necessarily the struggles of the quest. It's a tricky. You know, the first thing I would say is make sure someone else is responsible for your governance. So I would have paid as a shareholder separately to being the CEO and founder an independent chair and an independent company secretary. Because most of the leverage points on me was a lack of an independent chair and effective company governance driven by a secretary. And they use their systems to manipulate those two ways. Right. Right. Because the chair is the voice of reason to shareholders. It's not the person in the seat. They, they're a good reminder of the past. Not the future, but the past. And a secretary is a, a lawyer that can outlawyer them, really, that knows the pulse of everything, that knows. And I got, I got that wrong. And that's something that you can really easily fix. But independent, you pay for them as a shareholder. You don't pay for them as the CEO. It's very different. You interview them as a shareholder. That's a really interesting thing because I didn't do that. That gives you a sense because they, they, they can only extract through things that they understand, right. which is staff, new investors, and um, the paperwork. The second thing is you have to run the top line you founder or not like there is the reason i get so annoyed with founders that don't speak to customers like this is the only thing that gives you leverage the top line revenue just being like growing running it telling shareholders where it is like everything else can be fixed underneath like it's like a because you no one expects you to build this business yet you know like they run, so, so profit can can be secondary a little bit but it's not it's, it's they just don't know if the top line revenue is growing, it gives you more time to fix everything else. And if you're doing something novel, you might need that more time. Like marketplace businesses are really hard to run, right? And if you've got a, an innovative model and an innovative product, it's really hard to do both. What's a marketplace model? It's like you've just got, you make money off people transacting in a new marketplace. But if your business is the marketplace, then the business model isn't always the same. You know, is it an entry fee? Is it an exit fee? Is it a cost per transaction? Are you a producer in a marketplace? Every marketplace business has operated a different strategy. Uber has a fee model, you know, of an app. Like, you, like but Apple Store, they own the organic app, so they drive the traffic. Like, there's all these things you've got to figure out. But it, it just means that you, you, you need time to figure out what the business model is to provide the most value for future innovation. But nearly every founder I speak to that's having trouble has forgotten about running the top line and their customers. You're indispensable. What I know about gatekeepers is that they would rather review a company and an individual through a data spreadsheet than pick up a phone and speak to the CEO of the customer that you're working with. They don't want to deal with real people doing real things. Why? Because back to the idea of a hedge fund, most of them come from that world or they trickle off into investment banking and the rest. And they make money based off showing something that could be wrong with a company that's not. That's why it's a short-term shorting. Like it's not a long-term. Like they're taking a short position for the short term. 
They're saying that you're not as valuable as you are, right? And isn't it fair to say- But that's their mindset. So if you're dealing with someone that creates reality in order to get a better price, then why would they speak to reality? There's a void it. And then the, other than revenue, the last thing I would say that you need to do is that you, you need to be, you, you might need to take a step back and out. Another form of waiting? Yeah. Yeah, maybe just a different company, different way, different group of people. <laughs> Got to let go of what that is. And how do you know when you've let go? How do you know when you've overcome the ordeal? When you remember who you are again. Like, it's not a big bullshit term. It's literally all this. Because the system is designed to try to get you to forget who you are. It's designed to quiet, quieten voices that are different, that are building steam. Yeah. And so is the end result at this moment in the, in the hero's journey, there is this moment of exquisite triumph. You've remembered who you are, but you are back to that exquisite loneliness of being who you are. Yeah, you're lonely as a king or queen without a kingdom. Right. Doesn't matter. You're lonely with a kingdom, you're lonely without it. What's the point? So where does the founder go from there? We know what the hero's journey says it is, but where do you say it is? Where does it go? Where are you going? As a king without his kingdom. I don't know how to answer that question. I do. Mm. I think you're going to a community of people who are watching this right now and thinking he knows something that can help me. I think it goes back to where these conversations started with the little boy who said, I can be useful to my mom. Mm. I think that's where it goes. It's the return to community because you're right, you're unemployable. You're right, you're alone. You're right that you now remember who you are. But you are now part of a community you can't fully see yet is leaning in to hear you. Not as the wise man, not as the teacher, not as the one who knows, but as a safe, trusted ally who puts mission first, people second, and self last. Those are the leaders we need. This is why you're a hero. And I think our next conversations, both community and eldering, are where you're headed. They're where you're headed, where you already are. Mm. So this is what overcoming the ordeal really looks like. It may feel lonely, but that's a hallucination. You're coming into a country that knows who you are and wants to see you. Mm. So thank you. Thank you.